How's it going, folks? Welcome to Found Flicks. On this inning explained, we're looking at Titane following a woman with a titanium plate in her head who embarks on a bizarre journey involving her fetish for cars. That simple plot description leaves out a whole lot of what to expect from this one. Bizarre is definitely a good word, though. And I can honestly say I did not know what I was in for with this one. It ended up being a pretty wild ride overall. And it even won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. It's like the biggest prize they got, you know? Nine minute standing ovation after all that kind of jazz. I'm glad that something so unique and just plain strange is being so acclaimed because its audaciousness and unpredictable nature is what really makes this one have a lasting impact on the viewer. I was a big fan of Julia de Carnau's previous film Raw and Titan really feels like a big evolution for the filmmaker. There's a lot of similar kinds of toying with genres including body horror leading to some disturbing moments but it also simultaneously tells a very personal character driven story. That's really the heart of the movie. It's trying to understand our characters' respective journeys, mainly Alexia, but also the man whose life she unexpectedly falls into, the ultra macho captain. Each have their own struggles to deal with, and that's the key to understanding the point of the movie beyond all the other crazy stuff. So let's check out Tatane, breaking down the story, looking at the important evolution of the characters, and explaining the ending and what it all means. We start zipping through the inner workings of an automobile, tangles of cables and churning machinery. Young Alexia Alexia hums along to the motor's whirring, her dad looking a bit tired and annoyed. He cranks the radio to drown out the sounds, so she starts kicking his seat in retaliation. He attempts to ignore her, but loses it, shouting at her to stop it. She pushes things further by removing her seatbelt and starts climbing towards the back. And in the moment that he turns back to wrangle her to her seat, they crash right into a barricade. Both do survive, but Alexia needs some serious surgery, including getting a titanium plate put into her skull. She already seems to have a strange kind of almost romantic connection with cars and feels the curves of it before giving it a hug and kiss. Okay. Several years later, Alexia is all grown up and works as a dancer. She also gets to continue her strange lust for automobiles, dancing on top of a caddy covered in flames. Her dancing and twerking draws a crowd, several politely asking for autographs. Another dude asks for a selfie, Alexia flashing a lifeless smile. Outside, more guys are waiting wanting an autograph, but she dismisses them saying that she's busy. She wanders off to an area by herself, but soon finds that she has a stalker on her tail. Following her all the way to her car, he tries to play innocent, saying he just wants an autograph and had been waiting for her for hours. Wow, I guess these girls are pretty popular, huh? Then things get weird, telling her that he loves her. While he knows that she probably doesn't, he's hopeful that they can at least be friends or something. Alex staring back at him with dagger eyes. He crosses the line even further, grabbing her and going for a kiss. She oddly reciprocates at first, getting real into it, before grabbing a needle from her hair and jamming it into his ear. He starts frothing at the mouth and convulses. Once he sees his moving, she kicks him off the car and drags him in the back seat. Well, so yeah, she just murdered that guy pretty casually and really doesn't seem that bothered about it, leading me to think that perhaps this was not her first kill. We also already have a lot of hints about Alexia as a character. Sexuality and romance don't really compute in a healthy way with her. She She's kind of disconnected from that side of herself. I mean, going right from making out with a guy to murdering him so coldly says a lot about all that. There's only one thing that she appears to connect with and also be attracted to, cars. When she returns to the showroom to wash off the dude's gore, a loud knock interrupts her. She takes a moment before peeking out and somehow the flaming caddy is out there waiting for her. Yes, she's being seduced by a car, that much is clear. She gets in the back seat and the car starts hopping up and down, the bouncing getting more aggressive. She's seen strapped in the back, moaning and flailing around, and we do see that this lovemaking experience is what she's been after. Quite a thrill compared to her generally cold demeanor. That seems to be the connection that she has with automobiles. They're cold and dead. Metal, you know? And she's kind of like that too. It's possible that this initially stemmed from her and her dad's icy relationship. As a kid, it feels like all she's trying to do is annoy him specifically to get a rise out of him, because otherwise there's nothing. It seems this remains the case now. As he comes in and fixes some food, the two don't utter a single word the entire time. Yeah, not much love going on there. There's also two important little tidbits overheard on the news, the first involving a young missing boy. The case has gone cold and is now considered closed. There's also a word of a man's recent murder, along with the possible emerging of a local serial killer. Yikes! Assuming this must be about Alexia, that guy was not her first murder as suspected. She goes
goes out on a kind of date with another dancer, Justine. And in a weird little connection to our first movie, this is the same actress and character name from Rob. Hmm, okay, what happened to vet school? They start making out, but she seems much more interested in her pierced nips. Again, steel, like the car. She gets too aggressive, Justine wincing, and she almost bites the whole thing right off, but Justine pushes her away. It looks like Alexia has even more problems on her hands, running to the sea and blowing chunks, noticing that her belly is getting bigger. Yep, she's pregnant with the caddy's baby. Even more telling, when checking around downstairs, what looks like motor oil is coming out of her body. Uh, yeah. She does attempt a little DIY remedy, but Justine calls out to her and they're back to make it out on the couch at some random ass house. She rests on her belly and gently strokes her hair. Then she suddenly stabs her in the side of the face to Justine's shock. They struggle on the couch and she jabs her several more times before suffocating her to death. Jeez, doesn't like girls that much either, I guess. Things become total bedlam as it turns out they're not alone in the house as there is some kind of sex party going on upstairs. This leads to her violently killing everyone that she comes across and there's also a ton of nudity and graphic violence and everything. So just to sum it up, she brutally murders everyone, okay? Of course, there's no way after all that that she can go back to doing her usual thing. She's gonna have to get out of town immediately. She first pays a visit to her home, her dad even seeing her all covered in blood and stuff when she walks up, but he has no reaction as usual. She sets a fire to all of her clothes and the flames quickly grow. So as an extra goodbye to her parents, she locks them in the room, dooming them to die as well. Geez, she is on a rampage. And sure, her dad was a dick, but her mom did seem all right the little bit we did see. She is able to make it to the airport, but the walls are already closing in, seeing a wanted notice for her on display. There's another notice that gives her pause, the same missing kid cold case, and she decides to do a desperate makeover in hopes of resembling the boy all grown up. She cuts her hair and shaves her eyebrows, plus has to tape up her breast and growing belly, looking pretty uncomfortable. The most painful though, it seems, is her nose, which she breaks by slamming into the side of a sink, her laughing insanely at her new look. So while this is obviously a physical change for Alexia, it also is the beginning of a transformation of herself, as we will see. She turns herself in, so to speak, and we meet the long-suffering boy Adrian's father, the captain. They suggest a DNA test, but he interjects that he can recognize his own son. They lift the blinds, and a slight tinge of emotion passes over the captain's face, only giving a slight nod yes to the officer. We don't know if he truly believes this is his son, but he is happy regardless to convince himself that he has returned after all these years grieving. Her silence, which she is most likely doing to avoid giving her away, starts getting to the captain, emotionally asking, why isn't she speaking? But he pulls back, telling her to just start speaking whenever she's ready. Perhaps almost surprised that this plan worked in the first place, she attempts to escape a few times on the road, but to no avail. She tries once more at their destination, but the captain quickly catches up to her, gravely assuring her he'll kill anyone that tries to hurt her, even himself. Well, looks like she's got no choice now, as they've made it to the fire station where he works and lives. Gonna have to see how long she can keep this charade going. He offers her her own private room, at least allowing her a chance to relax for the moment and removes the massive tape covering her body. Feeling around her belly, she starts aggressively scratching and the captain enters, her nearly getting caught already. He's confused seeing that she's sleeping in her clothes and demands to hand them over or he'll undress her himself. She does so only after he turns around and it looks like she's not going anywhere. The captain locking the door on the way out. Better than jail, at least. So we already know Alexia has a whole mess of issues, and the captain, we learn, is struggling with his own. He's still, you know, pretty buff considering his age, and it's all about maintaining his masculinity, despite his decaying body. To tip the scales of nature in his favor, he injects himself with roids, noticing several bruises on his body. The effects of it coursing within him hit quickly, Cap grunting into the mirror. He attempts to work out, but finds that he can't do as much as he wants to his frustration. He pulls himself up one more, shouting to his body, only to plummet to the ground, the failure causing him to completely lose his shit. Again for Cap, it's all about exuding that physical strength of masculinity, and he feels himself less of a man as it starts to fade more with age. I mean, shit though, he's still in way better shape than me, and he's decades older. Though there is another very tender or nurturing side to the Cap in how he treats Alexia, and helps her with her broken nose, now looking at least a little bit more decent. She's taken to meet the rest of the gang, who are already abuzz about their new 
visitor, people calling him the weirdo. Cap explains to them that this is his son, and as he's the god here, that would make him Jesus. So when they talk, you listen. After they leave, someone cracks a joke about, oh, I didn't know Jesus was white and gay, and another guy, Ray, who up to now seems like a surrogate kid for the Cap, tells him to be more respectful. Cap even starts training Alexia as a firefighter, starting off at a simulator. There he starts having visions that disturb him relating to his son, seeing kids' belongings on fire, and then inside of a cabinet, a child's body is there burning. We don't ever find out for certain what happened to his boy, but this seems to be to show us how much this has truly affected him to his core, and still does now. It also kind of feels like him having to confront letting go of those memories in a way, allowing the past to wash away for good and say goodbye. He again attempts to get Alexia to talk, but is drawn to a stain on her shirt, which must mean that she started lactating. He wants to see what it's all about, and she pulls away, stopped again by a locked door. He gets out her pick, ready to take him out if necessary, but Cap doesn't press the issue further, and rather puts on a record inviting her to dance. She turns him down, so he basically forces her to join in, spinning her around and bumping into his chest. He starts kind of playfully slapping her. In a flip to her own role earlier with her dad, the captain here is doing whatever he can to get her to show emotions. She certainly does so, grabbing his head, shoving him to the ground, and pulling out her pin. He is unafraid, asking if she's in a knitting club or something, and commands her to fight like a man. He easily overpowers her, and asks why it is that she's always trying to leave, as she's already home. To prove this point, he hands over the keys, allowing her to go, and she seizes a chance to leave immediately. Cap looks more miserable than ever, downing a pill with a glass of red, and does another roid shot. He stares at his reflection in disappointment, which sends him to retrieve the needle to take another dose. Jeez, dude, it really seems to mess him up, groaning and falling weakly to the ground. Alexia is about to leave town for good, but has a fateful experience when a bunch of drunk a-holes climb aboard the bus. They speak crassly about women, a hole being a hole and things of that ilk, and then turn their attention to catcalling another girl nearby. The two stare knowingly at each other, and it seems that this is what Alexia was used to in her former life. Here with her new look, the guys pay her no mind. This causes her to stay behind after all, and has another major conflict within herself. Finding the captain still passed out, she brings out her murder pick, but finds that she cannot kill him, and instead shaves off the rest of her hair, feeling like this is in a way her fully committing to pretending she's his son. She smacks him a few times in no response, and finally speaks, calling him dad. He still doesn't answer, so she takes him tenderly in her arms, cradling him until he comes to. Looking amongst Adrian's stuff, she finds what looks like a maternity dress and tries it on, checking out her ever-expanding belly. She hears Cap approaching and hides in the closet, but that doesn't last too long, as he goes right for the door. At the sight, he can't help but chuckle, wondering what the heck she's doing. He pulls out a box of photos and see that Adrian also wore the same dress as a kid, him now even more convinced that she is actually his boy. He gives her several heartfelt kisses and a big hug, obviously quite a far cry from the relationship she had with her own father. More on that in a bit. Cap takes things to the next level with Alexia, actually bringing her along on a call. Someone is unconscious, presumably from drugs, and Cap orders her to stay back and observe. Interestingly, her immediate reaction to the sight is to get nauseous, which is quite strange after all the blood that she's shed. Although this is a different circumstance than that, of course. They get to work intubating the guy, and perhaps in shock, his mom passes out. Ray steps in to help, but Cap tells him to stay behind, and instead asks Alexia to perform CPR, guiding her through the process via the tune of the Macarena. Pretty funny. But this whole setup that's developing here shows a very different kind of life for Alexia. Rather than selling her sexuality and killing people, now thanks to Cap's influence, she actually has helped save a life. It's thanks to him that she's learning about a very different and ultimately healthier path to lead, thanks to him actually loving her unconditionally. The sight of letting Alexia help obviously gets to Ray as though he's been replaced, and attempts to find out some dirt on her, even finding her wanted picture, considering if it could actually be her. Back at the firehouse, the boys are all hanging out and grooving, while Alexia watches on from the sidelines, almost kind of taking in the guy's behavior together. Ray comes in to spoil things, and tries to tell the captain all about it. He only gets as far as saying it's something about his boy, before Cap shuts him down, telling him don't talk about him ever. He goes back to her, confronting her to crawl back in the hole she came from. But Alexia is unbothered, joining her faux dad on the dance floor. He lifts her over his shoulders, spinning her around, him appearing quite happy. Eventually the fam has another visitor in Adrian's mom. She's confused at first at the sight of Alex, although when Cap pipes up to give her a kiss, after some 
some hesitancy, she does at least give her a hug. It seems that she already knows that something is up here and asks to talk to the cap alone. She asks how he does it, living next to their son's room. His belongings and even his smell still lingers there. Why is he inflicting that upon himself? Clearly, he hasn't been able to get over losing Adrian, and this could have been what caused their marriage to fall apart. Again, it's the same kind of masculine thing, like how could I lose my son? What a failure as a man. He puts his foot down. He won't let her take him, but she shrugs that she has no interest in doing so. Meanwhile, alone in a room, Alex takes the moment of privacy to scratch at her skin, noticing it's covered in scratches along with a black bruise on the side. When scratching at it furiously, she accidentally opens the hole deeper, seeing metal protruding out from under her skin. Uh-oh! She heaves and punches furiously at her womb, demanding it to stop. It's more painful than ever to reapply the tape, but it's even more alarming to see that her breasts are starting to emit motor oil. With absolutely perfect timing, the mom barges in and sees her totally Billy Bollocks, now knowing with certainty that it is not their son, if there was any question in the first place. She struts up and grabs her belly, asking what she would do if she couldn't mourn her own child. Again, him just going missing, there's no finality to that. She gets serious that whatever her twisted motivation here is, just make sure to take care of him. We've seen just how lonely and haunted Cap is, and all he really needs is someone there, her or whoever, just someone to fill that void. The news gives us another update on the lack of progression into the search for the young dancer whose murder shook the area, obviously Alexia, and she gets beckoned by the Cap to help with his precious roids. After initially hesitating, she collects herself to be there as the mom asked. She appears to have some experience with needle usage, hmm, wonder why, and is able to easily give him the poke. He takes his hand in hers and gives her a kiss on the cheek. Even though he's obviously falling apart in many ways, he insists he's supposed to take care of her, not the other way around. All part of his masculinity thing can't ever show weakness and that kind of stuff. By a similar token, Cap is concerned about his boy's lack of facial hair, and as the legend goes, you can shave it to help it grow faster. Though I'm not sure how much that is going to help in this case. The gang goes out in the woods to tend with a real fire this time, hearing what sounds like gunfire. Cap falls down and Ray appears worried, but of course Cap can't show weakness, bouncing right back to his feet. They come to a blazing fire surrounding an RV. They axe the door off and find what I'm assuming is a propane canister inside. Ray asks if they should secure it, and Cap just kind of jogs off. Yeah, good luck with that, I guess. Back in the truck, Alexia sees a huge explosion bloom into the sky above the trees. Whatever Ray was holding definitely blew up. Seeing Cap got blown back and his helmet broken, and he finds Ray already dead. While this did seem like an accident, I'm not so sure. I couldn't help but remember what Cap said from the very beginning. He would kill anyone that tried to hurt her. And while Ray certainly has soured on Alexia, I'm not so sure, but it's definitely possible this was on purpose. In the shower, the baby starts to move, and unlike before where she always has wanted it gone, she now smiles at the sight of life. Quite a change there. The house of cards, of course, inevitably tumbles, but it's clear that Cap doesn't actually care about who she is. As far as he's concerned, that's his boy. This makes a clear distinction. She has come to fill this role in his life. No matter what, he will always have unconditional love for her. Again, almost the complete opposite of her dad's vibes, and it feels that this is perhaps the first healthy relationship she's had with a man, stemming from, again, her dad, but also the creepos at the stripper auto shows. This is submitted further when her towel drops exposing her breasts, and he simply covers her back up. So, there you go. At another bro dance party, mostly shirtless naturally, they're all kind of pushing each other around mosh pit style, but not as aggressive. Bumping chests and stuff, you know, just guys being guys. Alexia gets sucked into the crowd and attempts to blend in with the others. Looking around, she sees a flash of a burned up ray. While distracted, a dude tackles her out of nowhere, sending her to the ground. Two bros carry her over to the fire truck, sending her climbing up to the top. They gather around, shouting his name in encouragement. A song kicks on. So she does what she does best, dancing in her very feminine stripper way, rubbing her body all seductively. In a strange reflection to where she started, performing for a crowd of dudes. The guys are completely baffled, staring silently in a blend of disgust slash confusion. Cap comes in and has a similar befuddled reaction, blankly watching her shaking her butt and stuff, him just leaving without a word. That's no way for a boy of mine to dance. Feeling dejected, she turns back to the one thing that had brought her pleasure before, and has sex with the fire truck. Definitely a sentence I never imagined saying in my life, yet this time she cries after. It seems that even this isn't cutting it anymore, or something about it all just feels off. I mean, besides the obvious. Cap is down too, playing with a lighter, considering setting himself on fire. He takes it to his shirt, and it quickly sets ablaze. He weakly attempts to stamp it out, as meanwhile 
while, it looks like Alexia's baby is coming. Her stomach tears further, revealing more metal underneath. Cap does get the fire out, looking broken, and starts weeping. She again attempts to leave, but is too weak to make it very far, and has no choice but to lean on the captain. She climbs in bed with him, and rests her head on his stomach to his confusion. They each say they love each other, and in the only way she understands to express this, starts trying to kiss him, you know, sexy-wise. It's all way too weird for him, and he backs away. He yanks back the sheet, seeing a puddle of oil as well as the metal in her tummy. She pleads with him not to go, admitting that she's scared and begins having contractions. He takes a moment to consider the insanity of the situation, and ultimately his unconditional love wins out, as he joins her side to help deliver the baby. She opens up a bit and finally reveals to him her true name, dropping the facade that's been going on the whole time, him telling her to keep pushing. As she does, her stomach tears away to more metal, and it's starting to look like this would be a very difficult thing to survive. He does manage to successfully get the child out, tears welling in his eyes. He sets it down and tries to get through to Alexia, but she's already gone. He cuts the cord and lays down in bed next to her body. When pulling back the blanket, we catch a glimpse of the baby, and it's definitely part machine, at least at the spine and a spot on the side of its head. I'm here, he repeats softly to the child, clutching it tight. So he did, in a way, get what he was wanting in the end, another chance with his son. And with Alexia's death, he would have been alone once more too. The duo randomly coming into each other's lives obviously had huge impacts on each. For Alexia, there was the whole kind of cold and violent nature that she had been living by, essentially incapable of real love. The open acceptedness of who she was and unconditional love showed Alex a whole new kind of relationship dynamic she'd never experienced before, especially when it comes to a father-like figure. Although they did grow to love her and Cap changed her in a positive way in many aspects, ultimately Alexia's actions have left her irredeemable. That's why it's a fitting sacrifice that with her death, she is able to give the ever-loving Cap what he needed. Sure, it's a car-human hybrid thingy, but I can bet you that Cap will learn to love it unconditionally, as we have seen so consistently. And it is kind of sweet that thanks to this experience, he is able to get a real second chance with a kid. That brings us to the conclusion of this ending explained for To Tame. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of To Tame and its ending? Do you have a different interpretation of all the madness? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.